the defining features of the Blackout Ripper's murders were his sadism. This wasn't the work of a mindless buffoon who bashed heads in with bricks, or a crazed loon who haphazardly hacked limbs to feed his fantasy. This was different. As with calculated glee, he calmly and cruelly filleted the flesh as these ladies lay dead or dying. Grinning, as through barely conscious slits, they watched with terrified eyes as he relished every slash and insertion. The pathologist Sir Bernard Spilsbury would later state that the wounds he inflicted were not committed in a state of homicide or frenzy, as each cut was cold, deliberate, and calculated. This killer wasn't skilled with a knife or had a specific biological agenda, but he had clearly taken his time and savoured every moment. But was he a sadist? As if Mabel Church and Edith Humphreys were his two earliest victims. Of those he murdered, he only mutilated those in the latter half of his spree. So were these first three interrupted before being defiled? Was he yet to explore his sadism? Or were these omissions a conscious choice? Gordon Frederick Cummings was a complicated man who could be both kind and cruel, sociable and sociopathic. And although the police decried these attacks as the work of a madman, in whom the pathologist expected to find evidence of sexual sadism and or sexual abnormalities. In Cummings, they found none. Sir Bernard Spilsbury stated his opinion some of that some of the wounds to the victims were deliberately made to look like the work of a sexual sadist. If Cummings was truly fueled by a pathological sadism, we would expect to find clues in his past which hinted a disturbed mind where the seeds of domination and mutilation were beginning to bloom. My name is Michael. I am your tour guide. This is Murder Mile. And I present to you the conclusion to Murder Mile's original eight-part series. This is the final part of the Blackout Ripper, First Blood. The trial of Gordon Frederick Cummings was unusual, as although the evidence would point towards a sexual sadist, his personality was more akin to a narcissist. Arrogance was often cited as his defining characteristic, as Cummings believed that he was smarter than the police, which made him complacent. He left fingerprints, clues, and the souvenirs he stole from his victims were often found in plain sight. What was so fascinating about the trial was how vehemently his family and friends professed his innocence which you would expect. But they couldn't believe that Gordon and this spree killer could possibly be the same man. The man they knew was not a sadist. He had no criminal record, no history of violence, and no known mental illnesses. He worked hard, he was good fun, and although unfaithful, he loved his wife and he was looking forward to becoming a father. Lodged by his family, an appeal was submitted to the Home Secretary, with Gordon's father John stating, My son, My son has shown no tendencies of sadism, and the fact that he has been happily married for years, he is known to be most patient, gentle, and even-tempered. On the 29th of April 1942, just days after his conviction, Cummings sent a letter from Brixton Prison to Dot and Lovie Williams, a corporal and his close friend who 
who was stationed with Cummings at RAF Predanac. In his letter, Cummings would state, The past few days have been a dreadful ordeal, and I am glad it's over. Now that I am here, my father and legal counsel are, I hope, redoubling their efforts to find the guilty man and to prove my innocence before it is too late. Giving us a hint into his sordid past in known brothels, he would go on to say, Jerry does seem to made a mess of bath, doesn't he? I wonder if the Christopher has been touched, or the hole in the wall. Perhaps not. Dens of iniquity always escape unscathed. And being a man who often rubbed people up the wrong way, or relished that thin line in humour between being amusing and inappropriate, he ended this letter with a really creepy line, which read, If there is any justice in the world, I'll be seeing you all again. If not, tell Gwen that I'll come and haunt her. Yours optimistically, Gordon. And that is what makes this case so fascinating. How did a seemingly ordinary man, with no criminal record, no obvious trauma which could have triggered these attacks, go on to commit one of the most heinous killing sprees in British history? The police would later state he was a viable suspect in two earlier murders. Two strangers, murdered in similar circumstances, which occurred just five days and half a mile apart. It's possible that Mabel was, but was Edith one of his earlier murders? Very little was reported about Edith's murder. As it was wartime, deaths were ten a penny, and hers occurred at the end of a spate of unconnected murders which the Met Police were struggling to solve. Born in 1891, Edith Eleonora Humphreys was on the cusp of her fifties by the autumn of 1941, making her the oldest but not by much of the Blackout Ripper's potential victims. With no photo, it's impossible to describe her. But as we know, Cummins did not have a type. Edith's life was as unremarkable as any other, full of highs and lows, but mostly of steady respectability. She was married to her loving but hard-working husband, who, it is said, rose from the rank of a humble cab driver to owning his own taxi firm. She was educated, either through schooling or years of self-betterment, and to do her bit for king and country during wartime, she volunteered as a canteen cook and a bookkeeper at the auxiliary fire service on nearby Caledonian Road. Being widowed and left to raise her stepson Roy, it is unclear whether Edith inherited the family home, a three-storey, semi-detached house at one Gloucester Crescent, just off Regent's Park. So either she was the landlady to several lodgers, or she lived in a two-roomed ground-floor flat at the back of the property. Either way, she was comfortably off, and with Roy having moved out, she lived there alone. In the same way that Mabel's virtue was besmirched before her body was even cold, it became open season for any loon to cast aspersions against Edith's life. With many drawing red rings around her 20 possible men friends and a supposed torrid affair with a fireman, implying that it was her sexual appetite and therefore her fault 
which possibly led to her death. But this was untrue. In her bedside drawer, two letters were later found, both accusing and retracting the fireman's wife's statement as a misunderstanding. Of her 20 possible men friends, most were ex-cabbies and pals of her late husband, who were both men and friends. And across that last year of her life, at different times, she had dated several men. But being a lonely widower, she was always looking for love. She wasn't much of a drinker. She didn't live a salacious life. And her only real issue was a boyfriend who was described as persistent. And that's it. All that seemed to connect Mabel and Edith were the methods of their murders. As if they were a rehearsal by a fledgling serial killer. Sir Bernard Spilsbury would later state in court, some of the wounds to the victims were deliberately made to look like the work of a sexual sadist. But were they? To answer that, set aside the shocking sight of each wound and ask the question, why did he inflict that wound at that point and for what reason? On the night of Sunday the 8th to Monday the 9th of February 1942, Evelyn Hamilton was attacked in an air raid shelter on Montague Place. She had a two-inch bruise to the right of her cheek. This was the initial attack. A small cut to her left eye, possibly sustained during her fall. And around her neck, bruises in the shape of four fingers and a thumb consistent with strangulation by a left-hander, like the Blackout Ripper. With a few specks of blood in her vagina, but no sperm nor contraceptives found, it was unlikely that she had been raped, as none of the others were. But she may have been violated with an unknown object. Partially stripped, with her legs spread, and her exposed genitals facing the shelter's entrance. She was posed to elicit shock. But it was not suggested that she had been mutilated, as the only unexplained wounds to her body was a two-inch cut to her leg and several small abrasions to her right breast, none of which were confirmed as inflicted by a weapon and could easily have been part of her struggle or his clawing. Evelyn Hamilton, as with Mabel and Edith, lacked any of the typically sadistic wounds found on the later victims. But he may have been disturbed mid-attack, or was yet to explore this level of sadism. On the night of Monday the 9th to Tuesday the 10th of February 1942, Evelyn Oatley was attacked in her Wardour Street flat with bruises to her sides, a bruise to her right cheek, and left-handed bruises to her throat. With none of her long fingernails broken, this indicated that there was no struggle. His initial attack was there to render her unconscious. But each wound, after this point, was a calculated ploy designed to maximize the horror of those who would find her and report their shock to the press. Stripped naked, with her breasts and genitals exposed, her body was positioned diagonally across the bed, facing the only entrance to this room. When found, she had 12 jagged rips to her flesh in and around her thighs and vagina, and spilling in thick pools from the bed to the door. Her last drops of blood had pumped from a five and a half inch gash to her neck. 
But what is most fascinating are not the wounds, but the weapons he used and what he did with them. Having violated her with a six-inch metal torch, he left it poking out of her vagina, as if he was bragging, Look, Look this, is this is what I did, and this is what I used. Between her thighs lay a metal can opener and a set of heated curling tongs, and beside her neck, a single, blood-stained, ever-ready razor blade. This wasn't a frenzied attack. It took time, it took thought, and it took patience. In his eyes, he wasn't a crazed maniac mutilating women. He was a skilled artist, perfecting his bloody masterpiece. The same sadistic performance art was inflicted on the bodies of his next two victims. Margaret Lowe and Doris June. Again, his initial attack was swift. They were trapped, punched and strangled. But as soon as they were unconscious or dying, it was only then that his shocking new artwork could begin. With a six-inch candle poking out of her genitals, around Margaret's body, he proudly placed the tools of his talent. A bread knife, two table knives, and a potato knife. To many, these were nothing but humble household implements. But to him, they were like his brushes, in which he inflicted a 10-inch long, 3-inch deep slice right up her right thigh, and a clean and perfectly straight 5-inch gash along her abdomen severing her uterus and exposing her intestines, all of which he finished off with several stabs to her vagina. With Doris, he sliced up her left breast, almost severing the nipple. He inflicted a series of deep slashes between two and a half and six and a half inches long across her abdomen. And the only possible reason he didn't insert anything inside her vagina was that in her last terrifying moments alive, she had wet herself. This time, he removed the weapon, but he had deliberately posed Doris, with her right hand by her genitals, as if drawing attention to her violation, and her left hand outstretched towards the door as if she had died, crying out for help. As a sexual sadist, there was no denying that he took great relish in torturing these women. But being a narcissist, he seemed less concerned about how petrified these women felt as they died, and more focused on his image, his art, and his reputation as a ripper. So was the murder of Edith Eleonora Humphreys a rehearsal for his four-day masterpiece? On Friday the 17th of October 1941, at 6.40am, Jill Steele, who lived on the first floor of one Gloucester Crescent, was awoken by the frantic yapping of a little black terrier. Edith had been dog-setting this usually quiet pooch for a tenant in the top floor flat. But with its barks growing ever more perturbed, Jill went to check. Descending the stairs, Jill cooed, Edith, but got no reply. Approaching slowly, she saw the door was wide open, but inside it was dark owing to the blackout blinds. Edith, again she got no reply. She flicked the light switch, 
but nothing happened as the electricity meter had run out. So always carrying her trusty torch in an area that was prone to power cuts, she shone its beam inside and was shocked by the sight. Found sprawled across her bed, Edith's face had been beaten with such force that her jaw had broken in several places. Pummeling her head into a purple swollen pulp, he had strangled her until she was rendered unconscious. Then as if her torture wasn't already cruel enough, he had slit open her throat so that when she breathed, blood bubbled from its frothing gash. And then, with a sadistic relish and a single swift blow, he had stabbed her in the head, the cold blade splitting apart her skull and penetrating her brain. When the police arrived, they found no witnesses to her attack. But with the terrier having been locked in her cupboard, it's likely her assailant was disturbed by its barking and he had cut his assault short. The investigation concluded. Edith had willingly let her attacker in. They had shared a cup of tea. She was wearing her nightdress, so either she or they were about to head to bed. Several items were stolen, such as a gold ring and some costume jewellery. And whoever he was, he had left behind his fingerprints. None of the neighbours heard a single sound or saw the man who Edith had invited home. All of her men friends were questioned and they all had alibis, including her very persistent boyfriend. But what shocked the police most was this. Six hours after she was attacked, Edith was still alive. Rushed to the National Temperance Hospital at 126 Hampstead Road, Edith was taken straight into surgery to be operated upon by the eminent brain surgeon, Dr. Guy Rigby Jones. She was barely alive, and although her chance of surviving, he thought was one in a million, he felt that she deserved the chance. Sadly, she died in surgery, and having never named her attacker, the case remains unsolved. So were the murders of Mabel Church and Edith Humphreys the work of the Blackout Ripper? They had both similarities and differences. So maybe their deaths show a logical escalation in his violence. Maybe in these murders, he was exploring the sadistic techniques which would later become part of his tried and tested method, and those which would not. And maybe, if Edith and Mabel were just a rehearsal, then there must be clues in his past which hindered him either being a spree killer in the making or a wannabe serial killer. Gordon Frederick Cummings joined the Royal Air Force on the 11th of November 1935 as a flight rigger at Henlow in Bedfordshire. From 1936 to the outbreak of war in September 1939, he was billeted at Aria Felixstowe, and until January 1941, he was based at Aria Helensburgh in Dumbartonshire, Scotland. His job was as a mechanic repairing military aircraft. But as Britain entered the war, and he began working on classified experimental airplanes, his timings and movements would later prove difficult to pin down. During the murders of Mabel and Edith, 
between the 12th and 17th of October 1941. His timings are impossible to verify. As having spent six months at RAF Fighter Command at Colern in Wiltshire, although from the 6th of October 1941, he was posted to RAF Predenac in Cornwall, he wasn't billeted on site. Until early November, he would remain as a private lodger at the family home of Elizabeth Mary Field at Hall Farm in Colherne. Here he could come and go as he pleased. Unfortunately, there was no record of Cummings being in London during the murders of Mabel or Edith. That said, with his wife living in London and regularly visiting the West End, he often travelled the 80 miles from Cologne and the 200 miles from Predenac, either by train or having hitchhiked a ride. But what about his character? A man can disguise his movements, but he can never hide his true self. His landlady at Hall Farm in Cologne would later state, He was an intellectual man, but prone to exaggeration. He was even-tempered and a very likable person, but he had no extreme views. A description, backed up by Sidney Butler, the landlord of one of Gordon's local pubs, at the White Hart in Ford, Wiltshire, who later said, he had childish mannerisms. I considered him to be mentally abnormal. He would drink to excess and would often run out of money, but he was never objectionable and would never quarrel or fight. Fueled by a belief that he was not achieving greatness, Gordon was prone to lying and was nicknamed the Count and the Honourable Gordon Cummings, having professed to being the black sheep of an aristocratic family. This mirrors what his family would state, that he was a dreamer, but not a maniac. In his letter to Corporal Laurie Williams, his pal at RAF Predenac, it read, Jerry, Jerry does seem to made a mess of bath, doesn't he? I wonder if the Christopher has been touched, or the hole in the wall. Perhaps not. Dens of iniquity always escape unscathed. Way beyond his killing spree, he had a history of visiting sex workers and brothels, which was not something he was ashamed of. These included places such as Quiet Street, a known pickup place for prostitutes, the Hole in the Wall, the Christopher Hotel, the Francis Hotel, and the Royal Hotel in Bath. His sexual appetite was notorious, and yet he didn't have a criminal record. So either he was never caught, never charged, or the courts were unlikely to convict a wartime soldier of such a minor offence. None of the sex workers he frequented complained of his behaviour. His sexual preferences were normal, he treated them well, and he made no sadistic requests. His girlfriends said the same. There were no known incidents of assault, rape or strangulation. He was described as charming, if a little immature. His main vice was theft. Being unable to maintain a lavish lifestyle, on a mechanic's wage. In November 1941, at the Blue Peter Club in Mullion, it was alleged that he stole 35 pounds worth of jewelry from a flat above the club. The matter was dealt with privately and no formal complaint was ever made to the police. That same month, Bath police investigated reports of an airman stealing handbags at the hole in the wall, which just like tights and lipstick, were low cost but high value items he was known to steal and would gift to his secret girlfriends. 
Police later tracked down some of these ladies. But no items were found relating to the victims of his four-day killing spree, or Mabel Church and Edith Humphreys. The only hint of violence prior to these murders were two reports of women being assaulted by an airman on Quiet Street in Bath and in the village of Ford near Cullern. Sadly, they were unable to identify their attacker and therefore he was neither named nor charged. But was this him? So did the Blackout Ripper murder Mabel Church and Edith Humphreys? It's possible, as they fit the profile of a fledgling serial killer finding his feet, but they could easily match any other murderer, whether deliberate or accidental, who was stalking the unlit streets of London during wartime. If these were him, this confirms that he was not a spree killer, but a serial killer. A man who was calm, callous and controlled, who could come across as an ordinary chap and a sadistic killer in the very next beat. As of today, the police investigation files remain closed. But whether the name of Gordon Frederick Cummings appears in either of those case files is debatable. As I can find no conclusive proof that the police ever publicly stated that he was a viable suspect in either of those first two murders. It was only ever stated by the press several decades after the murders. It is also impossible to tell whether Cummings was a sadist or whether, having never achieved greatness, he merely wanted the notoriety that a case like this should have got, but didn't. And as he died, claiming his innocence, we shall never know his motives. The speed of his trial, his lack of confession, and the gaps in his history leave us with a lot of holes. As with his life riddled with lies and his crimes full of theories, we have very little in terms of a conclusion. So maybe he did snap and go on a killing spree. Maybe Edith and Mabel were a rehearsal. Maybe he did commit a string of rapes and assaults prior to this date, all of which went unreported. Or maybe he didn't only murder four women in the West End and potentially two more over four months. Maybe, as a soldier who lived in untraceable accommodations, who frequented different locations and who worked in several classified military bases across the UK. It is likely that there are other attacks and murders, possibly committed by Gordon Frederick Cummings, which are yet to be unearthed. So for now, this is not the end. The Blackout Ripper, First Blood, will return. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for listening to Murder Mile. That was the concluding part of this section of the Blackout Ripper First Blood. The next part will take months, if not years, to research, as this has never been done before, so don't expect it to arrive anytime soon. This was the last official episode of Murder Mile for this year. The new season will begin on Thursday the 24th of February 2022. But if you would like to keep up to date with all of the research for the new season, as well as for Murder Mile, the book, and to enjoy a whole back catalogue of photos, videos, and the exclusive podcast series Walk With Me, you can treat yourself to this by subscribing to Patreon for as little as just £2 a month. And with that, you can help support the podcast. After the break is Extra Mile. 
which includes the usual non-compulsory nonsense by a fat bald man who is yet to demolish his Christmas treats, as well as extra details on this case and a little quiz. So for the last time this year, Murder Mile was researched, written and performed by myself, with the main musical themes written and performed by Eric Stein and John Books of Cult With No Name. Thank you for listening, and Happy New Year. No! Oh! <laughs> Christ! Oh, dear Lord. Hello, everyone. How are we all? We all good? Good, happy, well, good, good, doing good, good, happy things, do da. Mike checks time, make sure he doesn't overrun. On this extra mile, I try and make sure that they're balanced, that they're about the same length. Otherwise, people go, oh, he spent all of his time doing your extra mile. What about the important bit? You know what you know what people are like. Anyway, um, uh, this is extra mile. As mentioned before, this is the non-compulsory bit. You don't have to listen to this. You can switch off now. Many people already have. I haven't got a problem with that. It's all good. This is just a bit of fun, but you get some extra details and you get a bit of a quiz. Um, I'm going to put on a cup of tea. It won't be coffee because this is three o'clock in the afternoon. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not doing a recording in the morning. It's, I, I'm, it's because we're so close to Christmas. I'm just opening up the, up the curtains. We're so close to Christmas at the moment. It's the what's the date today? 21st. 21st. I'm just going to pop on my cup of tea. Cup of cha. One cup of cha. Um, yeah, we're so close to Christmas. Um, either I just didn't. I just. Uh, uh, oh, my cup of tea. My cup of tea. I'm all over the shop. Uh, I just didn't want to uh, end up having to do some extra. Do some murder mile and then in the new year have to do more kind of. Uh, you know, I'm, I was hoping to take a bit of a holiday, well not a holiday, a kind of chance to relax. So I'm trying to power through as much as possible. Whoa. Uh, so I'm, I, do you know what? I am making a coffee now. I changed my mind. I treat myself. Instead of the other day of having a, uh, a Nescafe, which I t- tends to be a bit brutal, brutal, I treat myself to a little bit of a, a more posh instant coffee, which uh, is a little bit, a bit more flavour. It is very nice. It was the nath. The nath. So, uh, what else is going on? I've just started putting up my Christmas decorations. I don't, I don't really see the point. I, I live by myself, except Eva, obviously. Uh, so there's no real point putting up decorations. But I've put up some. I've put up some uh, Christmas lights. I've got Christmas lights on the outside. Christmas lights coming in. I've just bought some solar panelled ones. Because obviously I haven't got plug sockets. So I can't plug anything in. Everyone always goes, oh, we'll put up some lights. It's like, yeah, I haven't got Christmas. I haven't got plug sockets can't plug stuff in that's the problem with living on a boat uh so i've got to have the solar powered ones they're up uh eva started doing some decorations above which is basically just beer cans as always i can give them a look they're hanging from a piece of string uh there's only a handful on there there's about eight on there which is breakfast for her uh so that's all good um hidden away at the back of the boat, I have my bags of boozy treats. So over the last couple of months, I've been stockpiling. I know everyone says, eh, pandemic, you're not made to stockpile. But what I do is every time I go out, if I buy a pack of beer for like, I, I, I normally drink on a Friday. That's my one day a week when I I go, oh, do you know, have a bit of time off? I do that. I'll, I'll buy myself another pack. And then I put it in the, out in the engine bay and they're nice and cold. So out there is some boozy treats, uh, which is all good. Um. I'm hoping that before Christmas Eve, oh God, because I don't want to be working Christmas Eve, uh, I'm hoping to bring out a little Christmas treat for everyone, so that'll be coming out soon, hopefully. Uh, that'll be good, a little a little tiny episode, not, not a major thing, but I'm hoping to finish that. Um, just to say, if anyone, uh, those of you who are uh, working over the Christmas period, especially Christmas Day, thank you very much, especially those of you working in the NHS who must be absolutely flat out at the moment and, you know, all the all the delivery people and everyone everyone who works over Christmas. So, you know, if you are listening to this and you're working over Christmas, this episode is for you. Thank you very much. I've, I've worked Christmas myself voluntarily. It's fine. I'm all right with it. I, I, I don't mind it, to be honest. It's all right. Uh, I, used to, I just have a night. I just treat myself to nice food, uh, and then and then sneakily try and <laughs> try, try and watch TV. 
I was in a I was in a very important position at the BBC once, keeping keeping kind of an eye on things that were going on uh, uh, over the Christmas period, just basically watching the phones and shit. And I was so busy watching Empire Strikes Back and enjoying a nice big fry up with a hangover, I kind of missed something important, and uh, air, all, loads of shit kicked off, and it was all my fault. <laughs> well, it wasn't my fault the thing that kicked off, but it was my fault that we didn't pick up on it. So uh, yeah. Um, Hopefully, people who are doctors and uh, all that and all that don't uh, they don't make the same mistakes as me. Uh, coming back with my coffee. Haven't got a cake. Haven't got a cake because I wasn't planning to record until tomorrow. But I managed to. Ooh, sun's going down. Um, I I I I, uh, I wasn't planning to record till tomorrow, so I haven't got a cake. Ah, oh, so uh, yeah, I'll have to do without. <sighs> right, what else is going on? Um, Hoping to have a week off soon. That's that's why I'm powering ahead, trying to make sure everything's done. Uh, my f- I did my first Sunday without doing Murder Mile, the the walk. That was lovely. Did I did I take the day off? As I promised, no. I powered through because I was writing this script. But it needed to be done. I wanted to get it done. Uh, so I hope you enjoyed this one. Uh, but I'm hoping to take a week off soon. I was obviously I was hoping to go and see family, but covid restrictions unfortunately that's gonna scupper things and my dad has been really ill so uh i'm i'm backing away i'm not going to see anyone because i if i do get a chance to go and see my dad he's been he's been in and out of hospital and he's not doing particularly well uh i want to make sure that i'm safe i think there's a lot of people at the moment who go oh i want to oh it's christmas it's christmas gotta go and see family it's christmas it's christmas uh sod all the restrictions but it's kind of like this is the ironic thing that I find is, is there's a lot of people out there going, I demand to have a, have Christmas, Christmas. But it's like, how many of you saying that are actually Christians? That's the thing, isn't it? We all seem to get a bit excited about Christmas, but we all seem to forget it's a Christian festival. You know, it's odd, isn't it? It's very odd anyway. How, how we've kind of embraced it as a festival and yet we don't really embrace it because we're not religious. I'm certainly not. It's like Easter. Easter's just about Saint Chocolate or whatever his name is. I think we probably, we probably do put more effort into St. Patrick's Day. And the irony is the, the amount of people who are out on St. Patrick's Day aren't even Irish. Uh, or like Guinness. That's my favourite thing about St. Patrick's Day is people who are like, oh, like, they, they walk around being a little bit racist and going, oh, oh the look of the Irish, and putting on those shitty accents and those stupid fucking hats, which are the most horrible things in the world. And then they, they go, oh, I'll have a point to the black stuff, putting on those fucking stupid accents. And then they have a little swig of it, and then they go, oh, you can see it on their face, and they're like, oh, this is why I don't like Guinness, because it does taste like shit. Whereas for those of us who like Guinness, uh, myself included, and of course, please come to Arsenal Guinness. If you are working over Christmas, I know you probably are, sir. Best of, best of, best of, best of British to you. I hope we meet up get, meet up soon for some beers and, as promised, a bell goes. We've got to do a bell goes. Uh, yes, people always drink the the uh, Guinness and then go, ooh, horrible. Anyway, I like Guinness. I like I like all that stuff. Um, uh, what else is going on? I haven't got a cake, but tonight I will be making another ramen. I've really got into making ramen because you can just shove loads of shit into a big bowl, chillify it, add in your noodles, job done. Oh, I love it. I'm going to have another one tonight. Um, with with uh, I haven't got any prawns to go in it, so I'm using one of those, those fish sticks. Those uh, can, can packed together, meant to be crab sticks, but they're not. It's just kind of a white bait fish with uh, a, a paprika c- colouring on top. There you go. Oh, that was that was pointless, Michael. Right, let's go into some questions uh, for the quiz. Don't forget, I'll probably balls these up in the next bit, but don't worry about that. Right, question number one. What rank was Gordon's pal, Laurie Watkins? Mm, did you remember? Ooh. I was watching uh, the, 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 this Jimmy Carr quiz that's on yesterday about um, where they they ask they they compose the questions while the while the series is go the episode's going on and then you have to rem- and it's real I was like oh shit this is going to be difficult but I got through most of it it was quite good it's it's interesting it's not questions like what 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 team scored what goal it's like they'll be having a conversation with you and then the next lot of questions will be what you've just discussed I think it's called li- I have literally just told you that or something like that and it's a uh, it's interesting it's amazing how much your memory can retain even when it's banal questions that just seem to go nowhere so question one what rank was gordon's pal laurie watkins question two what did edith's husband do as a job can have a slurp of my tea my coffee 
God, I've only half filled it. What a knob. Uh, question number three. Uh, what colour was the terrier locked in Edith's cupboard? Question four. What was Edith's stepson's name? I have a problem saying Edith. I've struggled with that, especially her middle name, which was uh, Edith Eleanorva Humphreys. Seems to be things that I can't pronounce. Question five. How many days apart were the murders of Edith and Mabel? Question six. What was the name of the street in Bath where the Blackout Ripper picked up sex workers? Question seven. What job connected Mabel and Edith? Question eight. Name all four confirmed murder victims of the Blackout Ripper in chronological order. There you go, enjoy that. Enjoy that with your Christmas hangover. Uh, question nine. In his letter to Laurie, what was the name of the girl that Gordon said he was going to haunt? And question ten. What was the name of the neighbour who found Edith's body? Right, right. Uh... Oh, did I miss something on here? Oh, yeah, no, I did miss something. Um, um, so just to say, uh, if you're a listener on Spotify, finally, it's taken bloody years of us complaining, uh, finally, you can now put a rating for Murder Mile Podcast on Spotify, which is really great. So if you like Murder Mile, uh, it's a great way to support the show. It's it's entirely free. If you've got Spotify, all you've got to do, uh, you don't. The great thing is, you don't have to put any words in there. You don't have to compose anything. You literally just it it, it says how many stars do you want to give it. If you give it five stars, that'd be lovely. It takes two seconds. Job done, and you can walk away. And it's very much appreciated. It's a fantastic way to support the show. So if you're on Spotify. Uh, I think it's the, the two little, three little dots are there. You click on that and it says rate this show. Or after you listen to uh, a podcast, I think it comes up afterwards. Either way, if you can do that, you listen to it in spot. You can do it while you're listening to this. You can do it right now. That'd be lovely. That'd be really much appreciated. Um, and if you want to, uh, flag it up on uh, any of the social media. Give, do like a, a screen grab or something. Just say, I've I've given Murdermar five stars and that'll be lovely. I will reply back. Oh, and, and of course, not just Spotify, any other platforms as well. Right, let's do some extra details and then we'll do the answers to the questions unless I balls them up, which I probably will do. Uh, oh, yeah, just to say, if, if you think if you think that uh, the, the Blackout Ripper committed either of these murders or both of them or none of them, um, feel free to post some your theories online. I'd love to. I'd love to read them. I'd love to know what people think. So let's dive into some details earlier in the case. As mentioned during the trial, so uh, John, who was uh, Gordon's father, and Marjorie, his wife, um, they couldn't believe that uh, Gordon Frederick Cummins could have committed any of these crimes, even though kind of the evidence point to it. His finger, his fingerprints were absolutely everywhere. Uh, but they blamed it on a cadet called uh, Cadet Raymond James Richardson Beetham who was based in the same billet over at Regent's Park and had been arrested and charged with murder and he was being held at Feltham. Uh, now, I looked into his history. He kind of, he doesn't really have much of a violent history. He seems to have been charged with theft a couple of times. Uh, not long before this, he was based out of North. I think he was out of Ghoul, I think he came from. Uh, and he'd been charged with stealing a car. Um... Uh, quite a few young people, if they were charged with uh, uh, offences around this time, they either had a choice of going to prison. They didn't want to fill up the prisons with kind of people because it's kind of a waste of time. Also, the government had emptied a lot of the prisons with kind of the low ranking prisoners to make way for army deserters and potential spies. Uh, this was something they did late in 1939. So... um uh, looked at his history what seems to have happened is around a, it wasn't around the similar time it was kind of a couple of months before uh he he had been uh they'd found a bloodied towel in his possession uh but when the police looked into it it looked as if either uh, his girlfriend at the time had either miscarried a baby or had a a, a possible abortion so uh hence there's very little about i was gonna uh, try and do a, a murder mile episode on this but there's literally nothing um i might have a look in the archive see if, if there's anything as well 
because of course we've got uh the blackout ripper first blood new season I, I literally only just thought of it today i was like oh great I've done the blackout ripper eight part series then the concluding two part series which kind of tops everything off but as i was sitting there i was just going i was going through his blackout ripper's back history and i was just like like i i've i I've pieced together all of the dates where he's he's been since well since birth really i kind of know where he is but especially those kind of teenage years and beyond and i i, I just thought to myself there has to be more I, I do you know i know what his mo is i know what kind of things he likes let's have a little explore see what i can find so uh it'll take bloody ages but let's see what happens um uh, uh the uh, his uh wife and uh father both uh as mentioned in the episode they said that uh they felt that the police had planted evidence they also said that uh th the police had taken gordon frederick cummings fingerprints and had placed them in all different a, a, a locations in order to kind of uh you know say that he was guilty um now this is clearly bullshit uh but um there is a, there is a, p a potential for logic in it because when you think about it around this same time uh, obviously there was a lot of co corruption in the police that was going on we've kind of dived into that a couple of times on murder mile especially in the late 1940s post-war there was a big clean up in the police force because there was a lot of kind of corrupt police officers uh and it was kind of endemic in there but also let's not just forget that 1942 two or 43 uh was around the era of operation mincemeat and uh, sir bernard spilsbury the home office pathologist was key in the creation of one of the biggest ever deceptions and that was operation mincemeat which was uh involved glindor michael the homeless guy in episode 40 who they made look like a a, a british officer so there's a possibility that obviously people around that time wouldn't have known about Spilsbury and his connection to Operation Mincemeat. Also, uh, Ingleby Oddie, the coroner, was involved in that as well. So there's possibility. There's possibility there. But I, I, I really do think that this is, as always, this is the family kind of clutching at straws. Um, um, timings. It's really hard to pin down his timings. Um, we don't have any confirmation that he was anywhere near London around the dates of uh, early October uh, 1941. Um, the week before, uh, as mentioned, he'd moved from uh, Colne in Wiltshire to RAF Predanac, which is uh, a lizard point down in Cornwall. So the south, in the reach shredded wheat, southwest uh far corner it's a it's a very very remote place that just literally opened up the airbase there i think it had opened in may 1941 so it hadn't been open that long it was still experimental uh, there's a lot of kind of experimental aircraft there so it was very private so um he would have been busy that week so we don't know whether he was actually uh, in london or near regent's park or whether as kind of a crossover point maybe he was given leave but we don't know because they 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 had records of leave but it wasn't available around this around the time the detectives involved in the murders had got in touch so with the with the uh killing spree the four day the four day killing spree they'd got in touch with kind of gordon frederick cummings seniors and tried to get information of where he was at what point but because he worked on a uh, secret amphibious aircraft it was secret so the you know they it was classified they couldn't tell them anything uh and a lot of these records would have been destroyed post-war so um we don't know we don't know where whether he was there there's nothing that says he was uh as mentioned with travel we don't have any confirmation of travel of whether he got there or not um um there's no sightings of him there none that we know of so uh, this makes everything really difficult but as mentioned, servicemen could easily get to and from London. Colerne is about three hours. Uh, Predanac is ab about five hours. Um, they could either go by train or, as m many people did, uh, um, um, servicemen were meant to have a ticket. Uh, quite often they could go on a train and if they didn't have a ticket ticket you know quite often ticket inspectors would turn a blind eye but they needed to have money to buy tickets now because we know that uh, uh gordon frederick cummings liked to splash out money likelihood is he may not have bought a ticket he might try to wing it he might try to have charmed his way through or he may have done what many people did uh which was hitchhiked hitchhiked uh 
you could basically just stand there. He's a serviceman. He, he knows that many many kind of drivers would pick him up. So uh, uh, that's likely, but obviously we don't have uh, information on that. Um, what else have we got? Uh, we know that he uh, travelled to and from London to see his wife, who lived in Barnes, and she worked uh, just off the Strand over at Oldwich. Um, in London around that time, he didn't. He did uh, in that base. He didn't seem to have any regular friends, uh, but he did have others dotted around. Other people did seem to like him. He was a bit of a tit, let's be honest, but um, uh, that seemed to be fine. Um, he. He didn't seem to feel that he was achieving much in life. When you look at when you, if you go back to the final episode of uh, the Blackout Ripper, the eight part series, we dive into his past and he seems to drift a lot. He seems to do jobs for a bit. He's not particularly good at it. Uh, people seem to say he's fine, but he can be a bit of a tit. He turns up drunk sometimes. He can be a be a bit of a, a, a bragger and an arsehole. This seemed to be a point in his life when he wanted to achieve something. So he joined the uh, aircrew receiving centre on that three week course because. Uh, uh, he wanted to train. He wanted to go from being a mechanic to a Spitfire pilot. He wanted to live the dream. Um, obviously, around this time, Spitfire pilots did not have a uh, longevity. Unfortunately, because the training was so short, um, many really wouldn't last that long. I think, what was it? The 20, what are they called? The 27 minuters? I, I, something like that. There was a series of, of uh, uh, pilots who were trained and... If you got past that point, you were great. But uh, so many, because they were uns they weren't fully trained and they hadn't got time to train them, they wouldn't last that long in a dogfight, especially when you're against another pilot who who is seriously trained and knows what they're doing. Uh, let's have a look. Oh, uh, I've I've written some thoughts here. What have I written? Yeah. I'm going to be diving into uh, in the new Blackout Ripper series. Well, I, I mean, who knows if I can even pull this off? It could be. It could be that uh, I dive into these cases and all he does is sit on his ass. You know, there could be things that just aren't reported. But you know, he 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 was in places like Plymouth. He was in Catterick. He was in, in Dumbartonshire. He moved around a lot. We know that he stole handbags. We know that he stole money. We know that he stole jewels, but nothing particularly precious. Some things he would sell, some things he would keep, some things he would give to girlfriends. Uh, he didn't seem to break into places. Uh, he didn't... Oh, I've got hiccups now. He always seemed to be invited in by ladies he would attack. Uh, he often drank. He was normally a bit, a little bit pissed. Um, but... He could be, he, as mentioned, he suffered with erectile uh, dysfunction, which seems to be a lot of the trigger points with him, whether it's down to the idea that uh, the lady who was with, whether she found it funny, that seems to have triggered it, or whether she was just okay with it. Um, it's, it's a hard one to really pin down exactly what kind of... Um, <sighs> What seems to pin down what what causes him to kill? It's really weird. Um, in this case, um, now in a in a lot of I've mentioned at the start about uh, there's a lot of unscrupulous writers in there, and a lot of people have kind of tried to piece together uh, the murders of Edith Humphreys and Mabel Church and link them to the Blackout Ripper. And quite a few people have said in there um, that these two first murders were killed were. Uh, committed by a left-hander right there's no evidence in there at all probably in the police files but we don't have access to that therefore anyone saying that he was committed by a left-hander this is bullshit the only times that a left-hander is mentioned is in kind of newspapers decades later when they already know about the blackout ripper and they try and tribute it but at no point uh, are, are there throttle marks around the neck as you've seen with uh uh, Evelyn Hamilton and Evelyn Oakley they were left handed they had bruises around the neck so we've seen that uh, with the later ones they were they were strangled uh, using a pair of tights and the knot is found in a specific place at the back of the neck which can only be done by a left hander a right hander would have a knot in a different place and they would tie it in a different way as well um, also the stab wound to uh, Edith Humphrey's head uh, we don't know whether it's left or right you, you've seen with the kind of the um You've seen with uh, Mabel Church that the likelihood is that with that one, it was a left-hander because she was punched 
uh, punched on the right hand side. Same with uh, Evelyn Hamilton. Same same injuries. Le- uh, 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 right hand side of the face, which means it was a left handed attack. Unless she was facing a different way, that's that could be a, a possibility. But with because uh, we know very little about um, I can't forget her name. Humphreys. Oh, there's so many people and so many names. They're all bloody similar. Edith Humphreys. Um, we don't know uh, how, what hand he used to beat her about the head. We don't know oh, whether it's a left-handed stab or a right-handed stab. So, it, you know, we just don't know. Um, mm, I don't know. There's a lot of details that I just don't know about this case, which makes it really hard. So, uh, yeah. Anyway, I think that's it. I, I, I thought I'd put more details in here, but I haven't. That seems to be it. Uh, of, of course, um, what's always good is if, uh, as mentioned, if you go go to war with me, normally by the time I've edited the episode and I've kind of done all my details and I've had a really good think about it, by the time I've re-edited it, re-edited it and made it all sound lovely and really enjoyed it, my kind of all my ideas have kind of condensed and I kind of have a nice walk and have a really good think about it. So, uh, yeah, let's do some of the answers to the questions. So, <gasps> what rank was Gordon's pal, Lobby Watkins? He was a corporal. Question two. What did Edith's husband do as a job? He was a taxi driver, uh, but he also, it is said, owned a cab firm. Uh, question three. What colour was the terrier locked in Edith's cupboard? It was black. Question four. What was Edith's stepson's name? Uh, He was called Roy. I almost forgot to give the answer then. Question five. How many days apart were the murders of Edith and Mabel? Five. Question six. What was the name of the street in Bath where the Blackout Ripper picked up sex workers? It was called Quiet Street. Question seven. What job connected Mabel and Edith? They were both voluntary canteen workers. Uh, Now, the likely, as we mentioned in the first part, Mabel uh, worked at the YMCA, so the uh, um, hostels, uh, where she would have met loads of servicemen. This makes sense. So she could have met the Black Ripper there. Uh, Edith worked at the Auxiliary Fire Service over in Caledonian Road, um, which means it was a canteen for firemen. And given the fact that the Black Eyed Ripper was not a fireman, he wouldn't have been invited in. Therefore, it's unlikely that she would have met him there. Uh, Although, she could have met him elsewhere. Uh, We don't know much about Edith's life. This is what makes it really difficult. Um, uh, Question eight. Name all of the confirmed murder victims of the Black Eyed Ripper in chronological order. So the four confirmed were Evelyn Hamilton, Evelyn Oakley, Margaret Florence Lowe and Doris Juney, two of which I gave away in that section, so you should have got those. Uh, question nine. In his letter to Laurie, what was the name of the girl Gordon said he was going to haunt? Her name was Gwen. I wonder what Gwen's doing now. I wonder if she was haunted by him. That's a horrible thought, isn't it? Ugh. Uh, question ten. What was the name of the neighbour who found Edith's body? Her name was Jill Steele. So I think that's it. That's us done for this year. Um, Hope you enjoyed that. Hope you've enjoyed uh, Murder Mile for this year. As always, uh, as mentioned, I always take a kind of a little bit of a break just to give myself a a chance for my head to kind of recover uh, and to do the research on the new seasons. I'm hoping to go back to the National Archives, but because of uh, Omicron, Likelihood is the archives are going to shut, which is a shame because I've got all my files ready. I'm, I'm like, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to go and look at these files, but unfortunately, they might not be there. So, um, I, don't worry, I've got loads of other other uh, episodes that I can pull out, or uh, I could just start work on the Blackout Ripper First Blood Parts Three, or what, however many I end up doing. Anyway, that's it. Um, 
this is this isn't even Christmas yet, but uh, so you would have had Christmas, uh, and it's almost New Year. So uh, have yourself. I hope you had a good Christmas, and I hope you have yourself a good new good New Year. Thanks for supporting the show, and we'll see you all February the twenty fourth. Have a good week and year and month. Stay safe. Be good. Lots of love. Bye.